Today on CityCast Boise, after 30 years as a journalist in Boise, Betsy Russell is retired and ready to hit the slopes. We talk about obstacles she faced as a woman working at the legislature, her work with Idahoans for openness in government, and a memorable story of hers that changed the Idaho prisons for the better. It's Monday, February 6th, 2023. I'm Emma Arnold, and this is CityCast Boise. Hi, Betsy. It's so good to have you on the show. Hi, Emma. Thanks for having me. I have to say I am such a huge fan, and I'm so excited for you. You just retired. Congratulations. Thank you very much. What's it been like to take a step back from Idaho political reporting after so many years being like really right in the thick of things? It's been a really interesting transition. I'm loving it. <laughs> but, that's, <laughs> but that's partly because for like more than a quarter century, I could only ski on weekends. And for anyone who skis, <laughs> there are a lot more people there on the weekend than there are on weekdays. And so skiing on weekdays is something I've been wanting to do for a very long time. And that's something I'm now getting to do. And at the same time, I am I know the legislature's there. I'm still reading the newspaper. I'm watching the news. I'm in touch with the reporters at my former paper, the Idaho Press. And I'm still going to do some part-time work for the press in the future. However, I am taking the winter off. Well, let's talk a little bit about your incredible career. I was wondering... What are some like really particularly memorable or like impactful stories that you covered during your time that pop into your head right away that you're like, oh, I'm, I love doing that or I hated doing that or I'm so glad I did that? There are so many. I, I do think that probably my most impactful story that I ever did in my career was in the late 90s when I wrote a series on Idaho prisons and why Idaho had so many more people in prison as a percentage of our population than other states. It was my first um, computer-assisted investigative reporting story. I requested and got this database on who all was in prison and for what. And at that time, there wasn't easy access to that information. My newspaper, which at the time was the Spokesman Review, had to buy me a new hard drive <laughs> because the database <laughs> was too big for my computer. <laughs> but wow. we went through it all, and it turned out that there were four crimes that were not even felonies in most states that accounted for nearly a quarter of the people we had in prison. Um, simple drug possession, small time bad checks, driving without privileges, and driving under the influence. Oh, wow. And I also, as part of reporting that series, because I had been covering the legislature, I wrote about what it's like and what it was like at that time in the legislature each year on the topic of crime. And I went out into the prisons, I toured them, I talked to inmates. It was such an eye opener. It was absolutely fascinating. And of course, that was a story, a single story that I worked on for a long time. Most stories, especially in recent years, come and go much quicker than that. I do think of reporting a story as, as going on a journey, kind of where I, I start off as a lay person, talking to the experts, looking in documents, finding out you know, what's really going on. And then I have to make the journey all the way back to being a lay person and translate it all into English <laughs> that anybody can understand and make it clear. And that's a fun journey. I've enjoyed going on those journeys. I mean, I know it probably seems like an obvious question, but like, have you noticed a real tonal shift, you know, in the legislature? As somebody who's lived here most of my entire life, it feels like it's gotten uh, further and further to the right. But then when you talk about the 90s and, and being hard on crime and stuff, I'm like, oh, well, maybe not. Maybe we've kind of been in the same place uh, the whole time. So, I mean, there are always tonal shifts in the legislature because there's a lot of turnover in the legislature. And we have new legislators coming in all, all the time. But we've had one of the biggest turnovers we've seen in a long time just this year. And as a result, we have a whole lot of new freshman legislators who don't know how the system works, who might be proposing bills that are completely unworkable, but they will learn that lesson as they go along. Certainly, we have been a Republican-dominated state the whole time that I've covered Idaho politics. And the level of dominance in the legislature for the majority party has varied over that time. For example, back in 1990, we had a 50-50 split between Democrats and Republicans in the Senate. And that was very different from what we're seeing right now. Right now, the Democrats have very few seats, the Republicans have a ton, and the Republican Party itself 
has been moving further to the right or the far right in just the last couple of years. And so that's kind of what we're seeing reflected there, I think. But there, ha it's not the first time we've ever had crazy in the legislature. <laughs> <laughs> There's always been a bit of that. Um, and I was even remembering back when uh, um, I first covered the Idaho legislature in the 80s, um, and the Senate was kind of a crazy place. And there were a lot of uh, senators who were pranksters and like to uh, pull pranks on other senators and even reporters. And there was this pool of calm in the middle of all that crazy all the time. And it was um, then Senate President Pro Tem Mike Crapo. And he was the, <laughs> he was the calming influence back then. And so these days, in recent years, we've seen the House be more... Um, wild and tempestuous, and the Senate be calmer. Um, but that hasn't always been the case. Did you face any like obstacles or challenges as a female journalist in the field, especially back in the 80s and 90s? Oh, yeah. When I first got there, there were times I felt distinctly uncomfortable. Um, it was very male dominated. There were very few women. There were certain politicians who were known for looking down women's dresses and things like oh that. I started wearing like these incredibly high collars, you know, with a cameo right up at the top. <laughs> this is in the 80s with my suit. Uh, and I was as prim and proper as I could be to, to not allow any of that kind of thing. Also, occasionally, I would be trying to chase down a legislator and they would go into the men's room. Oh. I'm stuck, right? <laughs> so there was one time after I'd been covering it for a number of years when I was in the women's restroom. And I overheard two women lobbyists discussing something, and I picked up a news tip. And I thought, wow, okay, things are changing now. <laughs> you can actually also find things out in the women's restroom. <laughs> oh, my gosh, that's so funny. How do you think being a journalist in a smaller city like Boise is different from being a journalist in a larger city? Like, Because I feel like probably everybody knows you here and and you have to kind of maintain these interpersonal relationships like with if you were in DC maybe you would see these people like you know once every two years early in my career I did an way early I did an internship covering the California legislature in Sacramento and the place is like Congress I mean you don't even get to talk to the legislators for the most part you're going through layers and layers of staff and in an early reporting job in I worked for the South Lake Tahoe Daily Tribune and had some contact with the Nevada legislature. And they were so much more accessible. Um, and also their state officials. I remember I needed to contact the lieutenant governor of Nevada for a story. And another reporter gave me advice. Oh, just call him at his casino. So I did. And he answered the phone. <laughs> and after <laughs> California, it's like, wow. So, wow. <laughs> so Idaho is somewhere in between those two. I feel like Boise is a pretty big city. Um, but Idaho's a small state. Our population is small. And one thing I've really noticed over the years is that people in Idaho are a lot more interested in what's happening in their state legislature than people in certainly California or Nevada, because we have a small enough state population that people can actually have influence. And so they care and they watch it. And that's good. Yeah, that's that's actually really interesting. I, I kind of wondered about that. So are you planning to stay connected and involved with journalism during your retirement, like in, in Idaho? Or are you like, you're, you'll be skiing, nobody <laughs> nobody talked to Betsy? <laughs> I'm, I'm taking the winter off, but I'm still in touch with my pals at the Idaho Press. And I'll be doing some kind of part-time work for the paper after the ski season. It's not really clear yet what it'll be. But what I'm mainly focused on is mentoring the younger reporters. And so I'm a resource for them. And if I can supply some tips or a suggestion on someone to interview or a cell phone number, I do it. And I can even get texts from other reporters while I'm on the chairlift. And when I get to the top, I'll receive it. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that you're still like giving back and mentoring. That's really cool. That's definitely what something I want to keep doing. Um, but I have a lot I'd like to do in retirement um, that doesn't involve work. Basically, all the things I never had time to do. I mean, you know how work has become. I, for me personally, and I think probably for everyone, Work has expanded and expanded and expanded to where it takes over your life. And I would like to prioritize some things other than work in my life, and I'm ready to do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's let's switch gears and talk about something I know you're really passionate about. Um, can we talk about the importance of government transparency and open record requests? Um, I know that you're, you've worked for years with IDOG or Idahoans for Openness in Government. 
um, working to promote transparency and, and openness in records in Idaho. But like, where, do, where are we at with that? How are you feeling about that? So that is so incredibly important. And this is something I am still involved with in retirement is working with IDOG. And since 2004, we've been working to educate people in Idaho about two key open government laws, the public records law and the open meetings law, to get everybody to know what they require and to comply with them. And I think we have seen improvements in compliance. During the pandemic, we developed online seminars. And now we are regrouping. I am working with our new Idaho Secretary of State, Phil McGrain, and our Idaho State Controller, Brandon Wolf, both of whom are big advocates for transparency and openness in government. And IDOG will continue. I mean, for me as a reporter, I always needed the information so I could write my story and inform the public. But everybody needs the information about what's going on in government because it's our government. It's our taxpayer money. And this is a free country. We engage in self-government. And these laws make it pretty clear that the records of the state and the business of the state, they're the property of all of us. They're not the private property of those who are involved in government. The Idaho Open Meeting Law actually says in its preamble, quote, it is the policy of this state that formation of public policy is public business and shall not be conducted in secret. And so I was actually really surprised and kind of disappointed to see one thing that our new attorney general, Raul Labrador, did um, once he took office. He removed the online portal to request public records from his office and instead posted you know, the name and the mailing address of his public records custodian, who is his public information officer, and said, she will accept requests by mail. Well, there's a little problem with that. So I remember back in 2006, the Idaho legislature actually passed a law, passed a bill, saying that public agencies must accept public records requests via electronic mail and respond electronically. So that would violate the law if you didn't take them <laughs> electronically. Plus, our public records law has very strict time requirements. They have to respond within three days. If you have to snail mail in the request and then wait for a snail mailed reply, it's going to violate the three-day limit. There are reasons why this is the law in the state of Idaho. And so it turns out that the attorney general actually still does accept public records requests by email if a reporter, like one at the Idaho Press did last week that she reported on in a story, pushes it. But I think it's important for public officials to be open and accessible and welcoming of interest from the public in what's going on in their agency. And that's what we need to see, rather than any kind of efforts to clamp down on public records, increase secrecy, make it harder for people to find out what their government is doing. That's not what we should have happening in Idaho, because that's not the Idaho law. And it's, uh, you know, I hate to use a, a, a phrase that's been used so much, but it's not the Idaho way. <laughs> <laughs> Have you gotten pushback on that before? Or can you tell us about a time where you, you received resistance for at, trying to access records? Oh, sure. And not just me. I mean, I actually have pretty good luck when I try to access records because I'm really familiar with the law and I know what to say and, and uh, who to send stuff to. But I've heard from reporters and citizens all over the state over the years that I've been involved with IDOG about problems that they've had accessing public records, often because some local government official clear out in the middle of nowhere really doesn't know much about the law and tells them, well, you can't have that. That's private or something like that. Or wait till next week. Or <laughs> why do you want to know? What it, why are you so nosy, right? They actually don't have the right to ask that. The, the public records belong to the public. But in my experience, when those local officials, particularly those far out in some rural area who, who you know are paid very little, if they're paid at all, and are just trying to do the right thing by being involved in their government, when they find out what they're supposed to do, they immediately start doing it right. And I have had innumerable officials come up to me at the end of IDOG seminars and say, oh, we've been doing this wrong. We're going to change it. I'm so <laughs> glad I found out. And I'm glad they did too. That is so good to hear. So other than maybe these seminars and connecting with the website, what are some ways individuals and community members can get involved and support transparency in government? Well, pay attention. Subscribe to your local newspaper. Watch and listen to your local news. 
you can support iDog if you want. <laughs> you can become a member <laughs> for $10 uh, on the website. But part of, part of having ownership and self-government and the right to access our government involves participation. And so, I mean, another really important thing to do for that all to work is to vote. Everybody should vote because we are, have this enviable system. We are a free country where we get to decide what kind of government we want. And really only a small percentage of people vote, just like only a small percentage of people read the newspaper. They should all vote and they should all read the newspaper. Well, Betsy, I just admire you so much. And it's been such a pleasure and an honor to talk to you today. I hope you get so much skiing in and you have such a great winter. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy ski schedule to come talk to us today. <laughs> Thanks, Emma. Thanks for having me. And here's some news to know today from the Idaho Statesman. Last summer, Boise and Ty Warinka was filming a police interaction in a downtown parking garage when BPD Corporal Denny Carter approached him. The police officer claimed Warinka was interfering with an investigation, and he was charged with resisting arrest and obstruction. Those charges were dropped, and Warinka has now filed a tort claim against the city for wrongful arrest. That's all for today here on CityCast Boise. If you enjoyed the show, why not tell a friend? Leave us a review and subscribe to our Hey Boise newsletter. And be sure to tune in all this week. We'll be talking about love in Boise with some special guests that are sure to warm your heart. Bye.